This is a, a crucial topic uh, for this morning. Um, some of the same folks that we talked about last night, uh, probably Bart Ehrman is the, the most well-known, uh, a prolific writer, professor at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, uh, has written books uh, on, on this topic, as have others. And um, it's amazing, although it's been 12 years now, maybe almost 13 since Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code was first released, took the world by storm, the, uh, the misunderstanding and the misinformation that uh, abounds, even in, even in university circles. I've had students come to me and, and ask me about how the Council of Nicaea decided on the Christian canon. Council of Nicaea had nothing to do with selection of the books of the Bible. Dan Brown made that up as part of the plot of the Da Vinci Code. And there are university professors around North America who now teach it as fact. If, if you have any exposure to Catholic, Orthodox, Lutheran, Episcopal, Anglican churches, you know what Nicaea was about. It was about uh, Christology. It was about uh, deciding what... Uh, the church was going to affirm uh, in creedal fashion about Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit. Just a few years ago, you may recall the two or three weeks when the internet was uh, aglow with all kinds of uh, talk about uh, the so-called gospel of Jesus' wife. Karen King, professor at Harvard Divinity School, had... had uh, publicly uh, presented what uh, an antiquities dealer had uh, given her, uh, sold to her and, and to Harvard, uh, that was a scrap of a, a fourth century uh, papyrus and uh, Coptic uh, words, uh, just bits and pieces of different lines of text. And at one point it appeared that uh, the text in translation would, would read, uh, and Jesus said, my wife, and then the... <laughs> The text broke off. Um, this past summer, the uh, highly respected, some would say, the, the most internationally respected uh, journal of New Testament studies called New Testament Studies, published in Cambridge, uh, the British one, uh, had uh, an entire issue devoted to all the conclusive proof that that was a modern forgery and people were duped. But of course, that doesn't make the news. But there are one-sided scholarly presentations as well. The idea that uh, even if we get the right uh, councils and get the right dates and, and uh, don't add in spurious modern forgeries into the discussion, it still was mostly a political choice, rival parties, um, Gnosticism lost out uh, when maybe they were more deserving what we call orthodoxy was simply the product of uh, political infighting. And not only that, but once the winners won, they rewrote the history of how they got there. Didn't happen that way. We have to go back to the first century within the New Testament books themselves. There already are hints in John's gospel Jesus gives hints that the Holy Spirit's ministry will involve leading the disciples into further truth bringing to mind things that he had taught Paul, in 1 Timothy, quotes a text out of Deuteronomy as Scripture. Don't muzzle the ox when it's treading out grain and uses that to apply to, to Christian workers, why, why they should be supported financially. And then in the same breath, he quotes Jesus, particularly as we find it in Luke 10, that the worker is worthy of his wages. Is he already calling a passage out of Luke's gospel, scripture? 
Maybe he's only referring to the first one as scripture, but it's tantalizing. Certainly by the time we get to 2 Peter, and scholars debate when to date 2 Peter, and they debate whether Peter actually wrote it, but um, even on the very latest, most skeptical dates, we have an early 2nd century writing. I think we have a, a mid-1st century writing, and at the end of 2 Peter, the writer talks about Paul saying, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. That one's clear cut. Some collection, maybe not all of them that we know, but at least some collection of Paul's letters are being called scripture by another Christian author. And as we move through the second century, just checking to see if anything happened, um, we find uh, largely orthodox Christian writers, not the Gnostics, not those who are involved in other heterodox or heretical developments, but people within the apostolic tradition, occasionally moving into to areas uh, in terms of church structure that you can't find within the first century, but in terms of theology, pretty straightforward. What you could have found in the first century. People with mysterious names like uh, Polycarp and Ignatius and, and Clement and uh, writings like uh, the Didache, which is the Greek word for teaching, the so-called teaching of the Twelve Apostles, an epistle to an unknown Christian by the name of Diognetus, and, and you can see the names there. They're typically collected together in uh, a, a book, many English translations exist, called the Apostolic Fathers, and there are quotations and allusions to a majority of the books that would come in the New Testament. And the later you get in the second century, the more likely those quotations or allusions, aha, something's happening up here, that's a good sign. Um, good, good, but this isn't accomplishing anything, so things are happening up there apart from me, and that's wonderful, and I'll ignore it. Um, <laughs> that uh, begin to use the word scripture, or God said, or as the Lord Jesus said, uh, taught. And there are even texts that, that say things like, uh, in the name of one of these Christian authors, I, I command you, but not with the authority that the apostles had. There's a sense that a new age has come, a new era, but uh, in continuity with what went before. What really starts the process of large numbers of Christians thinking about a special collection of books that they would treat with the same authority as the uh, writings of what we now call the Old Testament were a series of events in the middle of the second century, including uh, the popularity of a, a famous bishop gone wrong by the name of Marcion. Marcion uh, predated one of the conversations we had last night at the panel, believing that the God of the Old Testament was a God of wrath and the God of Jesus Christ in the New Testament was a God of love, and therefore he rejected the Old Testament, and he rejected many Christian books that seemed too positive towards the Old Testament, and had a truncated canon of some of the letters of Paul and parts of the Gospel of Luke. And uh, he was rejected and, and roundly um, censored uh, and censured by uh, the majority of the church as uh, being far too narrow in his thinking. So what books should be included. This was the time in the middle of the second century of perhaps the, the peak of Gnosticism's popularity. And they were producing other writings, and, and I think Craig Evans is absolutely right. People who 
who date those books to the first century do so by wishful thinking, but the actual evidence shows, shows no awareness of them uh, prior to the middle of the second century. And, and they were heterodox. They were teaching other truths. And then there was uh, Roman persecution. Nero in the mid first century, Domitian at the end of the first century, were, were fairly mild in comparison. It got even worse. There were times when uh, if you were found harboring a, a Christian document, it could lead to your execution. And you and asked the question, I may not get it exactly right at the start of last night, what books would you be willing to die for? Would you be willing to die for the shepherd of Hermas? You say, I don't even know what's in it. And so people had to start thinking about canons. The oldest known list of such books that we have is something called the Muratorian Canon or Fragment in the late second century. And it's fragmentary. It's ripped off. <laughs> See, the original ripoff. We, we don't have it all, so we don't know what else he might have said, but we do know that 21 of the eventual 27 books appear there, including all four Gospels, including the book of Acts, including the 13 letters. Thank you. And now we'll, uh, there it is. Wonderful. What happens if we go backwards? He's my Savior. Humanly speaking, I don't want God to strike either of us dead. <laughs> the Muratorian Canon lists all four Gospels, it lists the book of Acts, it lists all 13 letters attributed to Paul. One, one of the things that uh, the revisionist writers of the 21st century often mislead people into thinking when they say, well, you know, some of the books were de debated. It's true, some of them were. But there's no record of a single one of the four Gospels or Acts or the major letters of Paul ever being debated. Oh, they don't bother to tell us that. Along comes a Christian by the name of Irenaeus. And... Well, let's see, jump forward here, yes. Here's his famous passage from a book called Against Heresies. He says, there are four Gospels and only four, neither more nor less, four like the points of the compass, four like the chief directions of the wind. The church spread all over the world, has in the Gospels four pillars and four winds blowing wherever people live. These four Gospels are in actual fact one single Gospel. A fourfold Gospel inspired by the one Spirit, a Gospel which has four aspects representing the work of the Son of God. And, and a lot of critics have said, what kind of argument is that? That's a pretty crummy one. Today, we know there aren't even four winds. I mean, yeah, there are four points on the compass, but they go back to when people thought the earth was flat. But a, a man named Michael Kruger, who's written two very significant books on the canon, points out, and others have said this as well, the only way an argument or a collection of arguments like that would make any sense was after it was already widely agreed upon that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the right authoritative witnesses to the life of Jesus. Maybe people in the ancient world believed in a flat earth, but that doesn't make that collection of arguments any more convincing to a second century person than it would today. Unless you already knew that there were four books that stood out head and shoulders above all the rest, and, and this is window dressing. These are, 
Yeah, how, how come it turned out that there were four? Well, it's like there's four points to the compass and four winds and so forth. Late second century, long before the Christians have any power base, long before there's political infighting, Tertullian comes along in the same period of time and is the first to talk about a novum testamentum, a new testament, a collection of authoritative books corresponding to the new covenant. Because in, in Greek, diatheke can mean either covenant or testament. Um, it can mean a will, like a person's last uh, writing, uh, who's going to get their inheritance. And there was a written testament of books for the Mosaic Covenant. Tertullian says it makes all the sense in the world that when God brings about his new covenant, there should be a, a, a collection, a testament testifying to that action also. Origen, right around 200, knows all 27. But he also knows that there are some disputes and then Athanasius in 363, Bishop of Alexandria, writes at Easter time uh, an encyclical letter to be circulated around the Christian churches in the Roman Empire, much like today, Catholic bishops still do the same thing. And he says, these are the 27 that everybody everywhere agrees on with a little bit of hyperbole. And they match the 27 that we know of. The councils that did discuss the canon and formally agreed on these 27 were in North Africa in the cities of Carthage and Hippo. Yes, I know that's also an animal that came later. Um, originally, hippos just meant horse, so a hippopotamus is a river horse. Maybe you've learned that before. And these were in the 390s. So what was disputed, and why? The seven books about which there was occasional discussion included Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. Hebrews does not begin in what we now think of as chapter 1, verse 1, with any attribution of authorship, unlike all of the other New Testament letters. There were debates even from the earliest days. Was this written by Paul? Was this written by Luke? Was this written by Silas? Was this written by Clement? Later on, Apollos. Others were added into the mix. There was uncertainty. Interestingly, they were all followers or companions of Paul, but there were debates. It's not just Martin Luther or modern people who read James, faith without works is dead, and wondered how that fit with the Apostle Paul's emphasis on salvation by grace through faith alone and not by works of the law. They're not incompatible, but they raised some questions, and some of those questions were debated in the early church. Second Peter has a, a very different style from First Peter. Did, did he actually write it? Did he write deliberately with a different style? Did somebody else edit it posthumously after he was martyred under Nero? Most of the debates about authorship of the biblical books are modern, but a few of them, especially with Hebrews and Second Peter, are ancient as well. What about Second and Third John? I mean, they're just really short, personal. Your Bible pages stick together, you don't know they're there. <laughs> are, are they timeless in truth? Jude's another very short one, and almost everything in Jude is uh, also in Second Peter chapter 2. Do we need it? Yeah, there's some important distinctives. But these were the kinds of issues that were debated, not Gnosticism. And Revelation, nobody's ever figured out what to do with it. 
Now, the problem is too many people have figured out what to do with it, and none of them agree. But uh, these were the issues that gave people pause in the ancient world, and yet despite that, the overwhelming number of ancient canonical lists by the time you get into the third and fourth centuries and beyond include them. And, and one of the intriguing things that goes flatly against what Ehrman and others say is, well, and of course, once these canons in the 390s uh, formalized scripture, nobody dared contradict them uh, because, you know, then, then the Christians were the ones persecuting. Not true at all. There are 5th and 6th century lists of canonical books that still have fuzzy edges, and people were still wondering about a few of these. The councils didn't exercise that kind of control, and, and they didn't censor people. This is modern mythology. There is no document that lists these are the following criteria that the council adopted as one by one they passed the documents before the bar of review. It, it didn't happen that way. But as one pieces together what ancient Christian writers say from a whole variety of contexts and synthesizes them, it becomes clear that central to labeling a book canonical was the conviction that it represented apostolic teaching and tradition. Sometimes written by one of the 12 apostles or Paul himself, sometimes by one of their associates, but almost always from the first century or at least that period of time while eyewitnesses, including apostles, even if only the last one, John, were still alive. There was also the conviction that the books hung together and presented a consistent message and were the fulfillment of the promises to Israel in the Old Testament. Almost nothing about Israel in the Gnostic works, and, and what is there seems to be somewhat anti-Semitic, very different in the canonical material. And then Catholicity. Not Roman Catholicity, just Catholic in the original meaning of that word is worldwide or universal. None of the 27 books we have were promoted just by one sect or one geographical location within Christianity. They were widely deemed as unique and authoritative. And one can add to that list uh, more subjective criteria. Dr. Wellam talked last night about self-attestation, uh, inspiration. Uh, those are, are, are more subjective uh, criteria that uh, if another person doesn't react the same way, uh, it's harder to have an adjudicating conversation, but they, they certainly were influential and widespread. So along comes this bizarre diagram and the second page of the handout. We don't have the time to survey all the Gnostic literature. We we'll just get a couple of big toes wet and then my time will be up. Gnosticism was a philosophy that was like a many-headed hydra, but core to the various Gnostic sects was the notion that there once was a single God who has now become very remote and almost unknowable, who, anticipating modern cell division, I tend to think of when I read the literature, subdivided and from him slash it emanated what were called eons, which in English means a period of time, but in Greek could also mean uh, gods or goddesses, of abstract virtues like light and life and truth and love and wisdom and one of these rebelled against the fullness of the Godhead, the Pleroma, and did something incredibly sinful, created the universe, 
created the material world because matter is inherently evil. So that Sophia, a feminine name and word meaning wisdom, was sent as the redeemer. And redemption was through gnosis, the Greek word for knowledge. This was an elitist sect. Sometimes it was made up only of men. These are not some of the things that uh, we always hear in the popular press. I talked last night about if you read these, you sense you're, you're not just reading a different kind of Jesus, you're talking about different topics altogether. Here's a document called the Gospel of Truth, and a text in it says the Gospel of Truth is a joy for those who have received from the Father of Truth the gift of knowing Him through the power of the Word that came forth from the Pleroma, the fullness of the Godhead, the one who is the thought and the mind of the Father. See all the, the mental imagery, all the knowledge. That is the one who is addressed as the Savior. And I have to look away so I can read it because the, the light's shining <laughs> in my eyes from the Lord. <laughs> Being the name of the work he is to perform for the redemption of those who were ignorant of the Father. While the name of the gospel is the proclamation of hope being discovery for those who search for him. Sounds just like gospel of Mark, right? Wrong. How about this from the treatise on the resurrection, another Gnostic text found in Egypt after World War II. I wonder if it works better this way. Hey, it does. Now, if we are manifest in this world wearing him, we are that one's beams, like, like rays of light. And we are embraced by him until our setting, that is to say, our death in this life. We are drawn to heaven like beams by the sun, by him, not being restrained by anything. This is the spiritual resurrection which swallows up the psychic in the same way as the fleshly. See, the Gnostics didn't hope for bodily resurrection. That would mean being stuck with something evil for all eternity. They looked for disembodied, eternal, spiritual immortality. Totally different worldview, totally different mindset. The thought of those who are saved shall not perish. The mind of those who have known him shall not perish. The body, it's going to perish, and that's a good thing for the Gnostic. Let no one be given cause to doubt concerning this. The visible members which are dead are body parts shall not be saved. I'm looking forward to a glorified, perfected body. I don't know about you. <laughs> the older I get, the more exciting that is. <laughs> Dan Brown made the Gospel of Philip really famous because he had one of his characters quote from, from this little bit, the companion of the Savior is Mary Magdalene. But Christ loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on her mouth. The rest of the disciples were offended by it and expressed disapproval. They said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? The Savior answered and said to them, why do I not love you? Like her when a blind man and one who sees, and I'm not one of those, are both together in darkness. They are no different from one another, but when the light comes, then he who sees will see the light and he who is blind will remain in darkness. Now you see all kinds of words in brackets. That's where the document is fragmentary. We don't even know that it read that the two of them kissed each other on the mouth. <laughs> That's the best guess by people trying to reconstruct this. But sometimes people did kiss on the mouth and kiss on the cheek, and it was a typical Middle Eastern greeting, and it still happens to this day in some cultures. Happens among older men in Russia where men kiss men on the lips, and when I go to that part of the world, I greet people with a handshake and, and, and try to keep my distance, and so far it's worked. <laughs> 
It wasn't erotic. And this isn't about Mary Magdalene being a, a, a lover. It's about her having elite spiritual knowledge. Dan Brown said, oh, yeah, the Aramaic for companion means wife. Well, A, no, it doesn't. And B, even if it did, so what? This is written in Coptic. There's no Aramaic behind it. But what about the Gospel of Thomas? Here we do have sayings that are sometimes very similar to the four Gospels. You can see a, a, a parable very similar to the parable of the mustard seed. There are 13 parables in the Gospel of Thomas, nine of which are reasonably closely parallel to what we find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And there are other sayings that are fairly similar to what we find in the Gospels, but then there are those that are, are quite different. If the flesh came into being because of spirit, it is a wonder. <laughs> something good made something bad. But if spirit came into being because of the body, it's a, a wonder of wonders. Something bad created something good. Indeed, I'm amazed at how this great wealth has made its home in this poverty, the spirit inside the body. That's unlike the Jesus of the New Testament completely. And here's one I like. His disciples said to him, is circumcision lawful or not? He said to them, if it were beneficial, their father would beget them already circumcised from their mother. They come out of the womb that way. Rather, the true circumcision in spirit has become completely profitable. No hint of any value in the Jewish background. And ladies, saying 114, well, you can just read it for yourself. Simon Peter said to them, let Mary leave us for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Shall we have an altar call? <laughs> Ladies, any of you who want to be saved, start coming. No, 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 we're not going to do that. <laughs> How about this from the Gospel of Peter? about the resurrection. They saw again three men come out from the sepulcher and two of them sustaining the other and a cross following them and the heads of the two reaching to heaven. But that of him who was led of them by the, the hand overpassing the heavens. Two guys whose heads touched the clouds and another whose, whose head poked through it and was above the clouds. And they heard a voice, heavenly voice coming out of the heavens crying, in King James English, hast thou preached to them that sleep? That's the modern translator. And from the cross there was heard the answer, yea. This is a docetic Christ. This is a Christ who's not fully human. This is a Christ who towers above the clouds. This is a whole different world and worldview. I guess that's my last quotation, and my time's pretty much up. There, there are other documents that are not Gnostic in nature. You can read what's called the Protevangelium of James and get the true story of how Mary was born sinless. See, see if you're Protestant, you probably don't think about the virgin birth as not really answering the question of how Christ could be sinless. Yeah, he was fully divine, but he still had Mary's DNA and, and weren't all humans sinful. And so there emerged this notion that Mary must have been sinless herself. Well, how is that possible? Well, her parents, Joachim and Anna, now you know their names, if the tradition is true, 
had the one act of sexual intercourse in the history of the world when Mary was conceived completely untainted by lust. How would anybody know that? They just made it up. Try to solve a theological problem. What was Jesus like as a child? Read the infancy gospel of Thomas. He outdoes Robin as the boy wonder in Batman. Breathing the breath of life into some clay birds and they fly away, saying, saying to a, a recalcitrant playmate, also in King James English translation, be thou withered up. And, and the kid withers. And, and the dad gets so upset he begs Joseph to beg Jesus to reverse it and he relents and lets the kid come back. The Acts of Paul and Thecla, all about how Paul really preached celibacy as the highest virtue, one of the earliest precursors to what would develop later in Roman Catholicism of the notion that a celibate life was for the, the highest spiritual offices. My favorite's got to be in a book called The Acts of John, where they're on the road and, and it's time for bed, and John is completely worn out and finds that his bed is full of bed bugs, and so he out loud commands the bed bugs to leave and all go over into a corner of the room, and to the amazement of his companions, suddenly there's this pile of bugs in the corner of the room, and he gets a good night's sleep. It's a different world. In 2013, a group of avant-garde scholars put together something called a New New Testament, the 27 books we have, plus 10 largely Gnostic editions, because there's a lot in there about knowing yourself and having knowledge within. It appeals to the modern mindset of a do-it-yourself religion and find truth within yourself. But you have to be very selective in the Gnostic literature to come away with that because there's a lot that all of us would find very objectionable. My time's up, but I'm here to say the church had good reasons for the books it chose. The choices were settled well before they had any power base and political wrangling. The minor disputes that did linger occurred in areas almost entirely unrelated to modern debates. And don't believe me, I've given you a bibliography for some good further reading. Thank you very much.